1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, last time we began chapter 2, and uh, I want to read, I want to begin this morning in verse 6 because we covered from verse 1 down through verse 6. And so we'll not repeat, I know it's been a couple weeks, but uh, here we are again. Uh, Verse 6, wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but of them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders dishallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Let me stop there and we'll make a few comments. That's probably my phone. Uh, it's been ringing off the hook. I need to put it on off. No, it wasn't my phone. Mine's off. Okay, thank you. But it's been dinging. It, dang, it dinged all the way here. So um, I, uh, I'm in a loop and uh, they bring up me up to date on the hour on my mother and different things. So um, that wasn't my phone. <laughs> wherefore, look, we, co- we commented last time on the wherefore of verse 1. And so again, it shows up, verse 6, wherefore, the simple word, the word is, uh, its meaning is for what reason or purpose. And everything he said there in the first chapter, he, now he's going to give you a reason for what he said. And if you just read the chapter uh, in your leisure, you'll say, okay, why did he say this? When you see the word wherefore, he's going to give you the reasons that he said what he said so that you can focus on what is the actual doctrinal ramification meaning uh, of the scriptures. And so uh, a lot of folks just miss the simple simple things. As spoken in verse 1, as we just referenced in the same chapter, we are now given reasons for why he said what he said. That is so important in the Word of God. People are not just saying things for no reason. They're there for our edification. That means our building up. They're there for our spiritual balance in an, in, in, in a, in an un, let me say, a spiritual misfit society. And I'm in the spiritual realm thinking, just bring it back to the literal everyday life and what we say. It gives you balance there too. So it is contained. I want you to notice that phrase, in, in verse, he says here, verse 6, where, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. I want you to, I want to emphasize that just a little bit. Uh, that, that particular phrase, it is contained in the scriptures. That is a key to understanding our Christian life. We can't understand it, make heads or tails out of it without the scriptures. Could I say this? The first base that you need to get to in talking to anyone about the Lord Jesus Christ is do you believe the scriptures? Now, if they say, I don't know what they are, you're almost in better standing than if they say, no, I don't believe the Bible's the word of God. If they say that, you're in trouble because our authority, our doctrine, uh, the salvation we preach and teach from the word of God all comes from the scriptures. It never comes from how you feel. Never comes from higher learning uh, in the in the secular world, I should say. But it comes from the Word of God, thus saith the Lord. So it is the very phrase. It is contained in the Scriptures. They say, "Oh, brother Phil, you can take that book any way you want to." That's why there's guidelines to understanding the Word of God. And the first guideline we teach it backwards and forwards. It must be rightly divided. You must take the things that are literal, literal. The things that are spiritual, spiritual. That's the two big, biggie bears. People want to try to spiritualize things. They want to literalize things that aren't. Say, how do I know? Most of the time, the scripture simply tells you these words that I speak unto you. They are spirit and they are truth. And so you have to watch. Sometimes there's a duel. So that now we're back into the elementary basics 
of understanding the scriptures. That's why it's so important. That's why the English language, the language we have the word preserved in, is so important. And you'll get people, you're going to get them. They're going to come through as pastors, teachers, and uh, uh, disciplers. People are going to come in and say, well, I, I tell you what, man, I sure love Jesus. And you're going to say, good, praise the Lord, hallelujah, man, I'm good to see you today. And everything's going to be going good. And you're going to say something like, well, um, man, when did you come to know Jesus? And they're going to say something like, uh, oh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Well, tell me about it. Yeah, I seen this bright light, man, up in the sky. First, I didn't know if it was a UFO, if it was the moon or the stars. I didn't know what it was. But all of a sudden, I thought, man, I remember my grandpa saying he seen a bright light, and man, he thought it was God. So I know that was God. So I'm going on how what I saw and what I felt, I, I'm saved because of that. And they'll give you some off-the-wall shenanigan that don't line up anywhere close to the Word of God and try to make you swallow it as gospel truth and you'll say, well, that ain't what the Bible says about getting saved. So, oh, I don't care what the Bible says. That's basically what they'll say. And when they say that, could I say this? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, wherefore also it is contained in the Scriptures. If it's not contained in the Scriptures, it's not extra biblical. It's not I've seen Jesus it's not I had a theophany, a theophany, I'll get it, well, can't even whistle today, Nick. That's close enough. I can whistle my fingers, but you, you'd think I was calling the dogs, amen. Anyway, I don't care what people have. They say, well, i seen this, or I felt this, or look. That's not what the Bible says salvation is. Uh, you, I'm not saying you didn't have an experience. I'm not saying you didn't see something. I'm not saying you didn't feel something. I'm simply saying it doesn't line up with the Word of God. So I'm going to stay with the book, and you can stay with whatever you want to believe, but I'm going saved, you're going lost. <coughs> oh, man, that's too narrow. You guys are too black and white up there. Man, everybody wants to go to heaven. Everybody wants to go, but everybody isn't going and generally it's because of their self-deception or their unwillingness to believe the scriptures. You're going to get somebody, they're going to come in here and say, oh, I experienced it. I had the feeling, man, goosebumps run up and down my spine. Well, let me pull that cord over there and cut it off and peel the two ends back and you put one in and one hand, other and other, and let me plug it in. I guarantee you're going to get some kind of feeling, and I'm going to guarantee you it's not the Holy Ghost. You're going to get goosebumps. Your teeth are going to chatter. You say, what is it? Well, that's called electricity. <laughs> and if <laughs> I get you a puddle of water to stand in and do it, it will knock you out, and it's not the Holy Ghost. Be careful what you feel. Uh, let me move on here. So it's contained in the scriptures. Everything is based on the scriptures. What does the Bible say about it? Somebody comes up with some philosophy, some idea, some feeling, some premonition, some vision. Okay, what does the Bible say about it? If the Bible shoots it down, I don't care how strong your premonition is. I don't care how strong your vision is. I don't care how strong your feeling is. I'm sticking with the Word of God. You say, why? It's supernatural. It's preserved. Uh, it's holy. It's set aside. It's righteous. It's pure. And it's never-ending. And it's going to judge you one of these days, whether you like it or not. And people do not like to be judged by the Word of God today, but it judges us daily. And if we'll let it judge us, it will redirect us. It will refocus our vision. It will help us to understand what the Christian life truly is. It does not lead people astray. So uh, it is contained in Scripture. Notice the focus is on the Lord and those that believed on Him. Because the Scripture says here in our text, Behold, I lay in Zion... A chief cornerstone, elect precious. You say, what's that? That's the Lord. 
The focus is on the Lord. And as we see the Holy Spirit of God inspiring the man Peter, the apostle Peter, to pen these words, uh, Peter turns his attention to the three Old Testament passages that he's quoting here uh, in, in our text to the truth that he writes. You say, why? Well, he made this statement as it's contained in the scripture. So he's going to use other passages, Old Testament passages, to prove what he's saying, to give you the wherewithal, the why. So in verse 6 down through verse 8, he quotes, I just read it, he is quoting Isaiah 28, verse 16, which refers to Messiah as the cornerstone. You know him as Christ Jesus, who is believed upon without disappointment. That's what the prophet said. Verse 6, there where we began to read in 2 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 2, then he quotes Psalms 118, and we'll read these in just a moment. Psalms 118, verse 22 down through verse 23, which refers to the stone. All these references have to do with the stone, which is Christ. And we're going to look at that. And remember when we started, he says, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. And verse 1, wherefore laying aside all malice and he is telling you the reasons why we believe like we believe. And the focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did, who he is, and what he says. And brother, when you get out of the book and you go with feelings, you go with visions, and you go with whatever else you want to conjure up that religion dangles out there, you're going to be more confused than a termite in a yo-yo. And that's right where the devil wants you, confused. And could I say this? The Bible declares emphatically God is not the author of confusion. Amen. Well, everybody's doing it. I mean, that's how what I, I got my testimony because I heard everybody else. Look, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to the Lord. Woo. So I thought that was just about sin. Hey, false religion is sin. Amen. Uh, people get all funny when you, okay. He's referring to the stone rejected by the builders that became the cornerstone, verse 7 in our text, unto those wherefore which believe he is precious. Then he starts talking about the unbelievers. And, and finally from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, he quotes this, which warns that those who reject the stone will stumble over it and be offended by it. Verse 8. And guess what? When you get somebody that comes, drifts in, they say, well, yeah, I had a vision. I had a feeling, man. I, I, I got lit up the other day and I know I got saved. That was the result of my salvation. And it don't line up with the word of God. And when you start telling them what the Word of God says, I will guarantee this. I will, Brother Phil guarantees this. They will be offended. And you won't, and you, and you're so nice. You're so pious. You're so good. You don't want to offend anybody. So you put your arm around and say, yeah, it'll all be okay. And you make them twofold more the child of hell than you are yourself. Oh, Brother Phil, you said that. No, I quoted it from the scriptures. Watch out how you handle people. Look, the Lord said, I come to bring an offense. I come to bring a sword. And a sword cuts, it divides. So well, I thought the Lord was love. Well, look, this book will balance you. You have to have love. You have to have compassion. But of all things, you have to stand on the truth of the word of God. And it will bring an offense to those that hear. A lot of people won't engage in any conversation with anybody that's controversial. And you know they don't line up the word of God. And they're just making statements. You won't say a word. You say, why? You don't want to be the one to offend them. And I don't know. I, is it because I'm a gabbard? Don't answer that, Pastor Holt. Yeah, help him, Jesus. My third cousin is laughing today. Nick Feller, third, fourth, fifth. I don't know, where are you, brother? Yeah, somewhere in there. But we both love fried chicken. Oh, what's that got to do? Nothing. 
Say, what do you say? I'm saying, look, the word of God does offend folks. I don't want it to offend people. Brother Tom can get up here and preach the sweetest message you ever heard. And I guarantee you out of the congregation we got, somebody will walk out and say, man, he offended me today. And he's one of the most gracious pastors I know of, always presents the gospel, always puts it out there, always gives you. And if he thinks you shortchange him when you're preaching, he'll get up and quote about half the New Testament just so you're clear when you walk out of here, you're without excuse. And even with all that, they'll go away offended. Oh, well, that's what they're doing up there. They'll find something to be offended of. But here, Peter, here, um, I told you he quoted Isaiah 28, 16. You know what Isaiah 28, 16 says? The prophet said this years before the Lord ever showed up. Verse 16, therefore, Isaiah 28, therefore, in other words, here we go with the wherefores and the therefores again. Here's the reason. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Watch out when he starts saying something. It's written down here for you to read it. It's back on the word of God again. It's contained in the scriptures. That's our lesson. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion. That's capital Z. That's a place. It's a proper noun is a person, place, or thing. Or a noun uh, is a person, place, or thing. It's a place. It's Zion. Mount Zion. Jerusalem. He says, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone. That stone all the way through the word of God. We won't run all the reference. It's always been a reference to the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. A tried stone. A precious cornerstone. A sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. So he, Isaiah the prophet, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God, penned these words down hundreds of years before Peter ever shows up. Peter gets to read all this stuff. Being a converted man, said, well, that fits right here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include that in verse 6, wherefore also it is contained in the Scriptures. And now you know when he says it's contained in the Scriptures, he's going to go back someplace and dig out what he's getting ready to say. And that's what he's doing here. So in our text, remember... He says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. That's Isaiah 28, 6. You say, what do you know about Peter? He was a student of the word of God. Uh, our job is to teach, perfecting of the saints, preach. Uh, I love that role as, as a minister. But man, just because you teach it and preach it doesn't mean everybody's going to get it. You, you, you know, I got it. <laughs> he also quotes Psalms 118. And it has to do with that stone, 118, 22, 23, verse 22. The stone which the builders refused. Because in our text, he says, he says here, Wherefore also it is pertained, verse 6, in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So he's covering the believing crowd, those that believe. And guess what? We're not confounded. When we hear the word of God, we accept it. We say, wow, I didn't quite see it like that before, but I see it now. I got it. And we go away blessed, we go away strengthened, we go away edified, built up. We go away with knowledge from the scriptures. Now watch, verse 7, unto you, therefore, again, here's some more reasons, which believe in his, in his precious, there's a colon there. He is precious, there's a colon there. Now, but unto them which be disobedient. Okay, he's going to cover both sides. That he's, going to, he's going to cover the sides that believe the word of God and the scriptures and that is contained in the scriptures that don't have any problem with that, that do not get offended when somebody lays it out straight. They don't get offended. And now he's going to talk about those that are disobedient that come in that really don't quite buy it all. But they want to be in your crowd. They want to be religious. They want to sing with you. They want to raise their hands with you. But they don't quite believe. They don't, they don't believe the book. Yeah. You say, are those people out there? I hate to tell you this, folks. They're in every church across the land. They're everywhere. You say, what is it? It's people trying to get to heaven without Jesus. Amen. Trying to get there. With, and I, you know, I feel for them. I do. Say, what, what do you do? Just keep preaching the truth, preaching the truth, preaching the truth, loving on them, letting them do, do what you can with them. Yeah. But there will come a time when you'll have to take a stand, and if that offends them, then that, that'll just have to offend them. Uh, so watch. He says here in verse 7, our text, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. Colon, stop the thought, uh, continue, continue in the same vein. Watch. But unto them which be disobedient. Okay, so there's a crew that's, okay, watch it. 
the stone which the builders dishallowed. Or in other words, the word dishallowed means uh, disowned, means I, I don't get it. I don't want it. Uh, I want a different stone. He says, dishallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. So he don't care if they want it or don't want it. He's still the head of the corner. He don't care if they believe it or don't believe it. He's still who he says he is. Verse 8, and 8, watch to these unbelievers, to these people that are disobedient. Now they're religious. They got a feeling. They saw a vision. Uh, they want to be part of your church. They want to sing. They want to play music. You see what I'm saying? He says, a stone, but he, become, he is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. In other words, when you start preaching a book and teaching a book, they're going to get out and they're going to walk out. You say, why? They're offended by the word of God. They're offended by you because you take a stand on the word of God. And it's not because they hate you. They don't hate you. They hate the word of God. They hate the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Brother Phil, you're painting it awful narrow. No, I'm, I'm just telling you what the book says here today. Uh, people say, well, I don't like Brother Phil's teaching. He's too hard. He's too narrow. Look, I know I appear as all those things. But any man that loves fried chicken like I do has a healthy love for the brother. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Be careful. But look, all my life, I've had a compassion for people all my life. And I would say, examine it. Go back 45 years. There's only one person sitting in this auditorium that might have known me 40 years ago. And that's uh, Mrs. Fancher. Maggie Hopping is not that old, but I've known her since she was young. Wilma's smiling at me. I have always loved people, but I've always spoke the truth. And sometimes the truth has offended folks. But the true believers, it's never offended. And so I'll stand on my record and my reputation. People say, well, I'm not coming to Sunday school class. We have that right here because Brother Phil's doing the teaching. I'm, yeah, I understand. I don't need to hear him. He's too narrow. And I got some friends that, you know, they don't believe like he believes. And I don't want to offend them. And I'm blah, 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 blah. I've heard it all. I get told that. I get texts that. I get messages on that. You say, what do you do? Nothing. Pray for them. Nothing I can do. Pray for them. Now that's personal, and, but I don't mind if you hear it. I don't mind if you see it. That's truth. That's transparency that most folks don't want to divulge because it's, it's like pointing a finger. Uh, but Isaiah 8, 14, he quotes this verse. He quotes Psalms. He quotes... Uh, and, and this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And then Isaiah 8, 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the house of Israel for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Obviously, that's to Jerusalem. Peter pulls it over into the church and those that are offended by the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, could I say, they're not just offended by the Lord Jesus Christ. They're offended by the word of God. Look, if you would, at verse 8 in our text, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble, watch it, watch it, at the word. Being disobedient, Whereunto also they were appointed. You remember when we started the classes, Hoosier Hills Bible Institute? Pastor Tom asked me to try to start that. I started that. It's been a few years now. COVID come along, knocked us out. We didn't do it anymore, but we'd meet after church and have. We had 37 students in that class. Out of 37 students, I was looking at my records the other day, about 13 of them wanted to take the test and come along. The rest of them were auditing the class. Say, what do you mean? They were there to hear what I was going to say. And brother, on certain things that I taught, word went back out and traveled and come back to me. Said, man, you don't believe like brother Tom does. No, we probably believe the same. <laughs> and if you stick around long enough, you'll see. <laughs> Uh, but you say, what is that? That's what happens when you take a stand on the Word of God, when you teach it with authority. People don't like the authority that comes with it. They don't like your voice lifted up. They don't like your tone. They don't like how fat I am. I don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> say, what is that? It's always going to be there. That's ministry. Get used to it. Oh, really? Just expect it. Yeah. 
You say, why? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Most of those folks don't even know it, that they're taken captive by the devil at his desire, and he uses Christians better than he uses lost folks. Amen. And you say, what's he do? So it's discord among the brethren. I like the class, and I still have all my records and all my stuff, and uh, all those that took the test and made hundreds and stuff like that was good and, and maxed out. And maybe we'll do it again. We'll see. COVID's got to finally end one of these days. I don't know. But let me say this. Verse 6, we learned in verse 5 that Jesus Christ is the, found, is the foundation stone. Could I speak from a builder's perspective? Uh, that determines the placement of all living stones. By the way, when you get saved, you become a living stone. And you get placed in the foundation. But you, when you build anything, you have to have a starting place. And as a construction worker, um, as a builder, uh, you understand that you just can't go out there and start. You've got to lay it out, find a corner, orient the plot location, orient the footers, and then you have got to put a good footer in so that you can get a good, if you're going to lay blocks or something like that or a stone, you start at a corner and you get that corner laid up and then you start from that corner. Everything works from that corner. That principle has followed through all the building world. And in the commercial world, you have to have a benchmark. A benchmark is shot off the center of a given state road. Like out here, they should have shot this. They did not. And they should have found the grade level of this elevation. And this should have brought, brought up to grade. And your code in this area would be eight inches above the center of that road out there. You say, what is that? That's a benchmark. That's a cornerstone. Didn't happen here. <laughs> We're a little lower, Teddy. <laughs> and the water puddles up out there. You say, what's going on? We had to cut a furrow. We had to cut a, a swell in our driveway to run the water this way and that way. You say, is that doable? Yeah, that's, that's the fix. If you don't have the money to put in the... Anyway, everything hinges from a beginning point, a benchmark, somewhere, a cornerstone. And Christ is our cornerstone in our faith. So here, to help us understand today's passage, we must remember that the ancient construction, the cornerstone was first situated on the foundation... And then all the other stones were aligned to it. Thus, as part of the house or building of God, we need to keep focus aligned to the cornerstone. And say, what's the cornerstone? I'll tell you what it is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God. You say, how do you know it? Because Peter talks about Christ being the cornerstone and the word of God. And when they're offended at Christ and the word of God, you're going to have trouble building with those folks. Amen. Peter points us to Isaiah 28, 16. We read it. He points us to Isaiah 28, 16. Um, I guess I've got another note here. But he also uses Romans 9, 33. I didn't refer to that verse, but let me, let me read it because the apostle Paul penned it. Paul, the apostle in verse 33 of Romans 9 says, And it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion. And he, he was a purist. He was transparent. He said, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone. <laughs> he said, well, people don't stumble at Christ. Yes, they do. <laughs> a rock of offense. <laughs> you realize that our church has probably already offended some people. <laughs> our preaching and teaching has probably offended some people. We're not trying to offend anybody, but it just does. He said, and, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So, but once you believe, once you become a believer, all of a sudden the Bible don't offend you anymore. The preacher don't offend you anymore. Uh, town council don't offend you anymore. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Jesus saith unto them, well, he quotes Romans 9, 33. He references Matthew 21, 42, where Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures? Again, it goes back to the scriptures. Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? And could I say this? The emphasis is almost always placed on how they rejected the cornerstone, how they rejected the building block, how they would not have it from the scriptures or of Christ. Yet they were religious. They handled the word of God. They saw their visions. They had their feelings but they were wrong 
and they were offended. So Matthew tells about it. He said, Jesus said, did ye never read in the scriptures? Sure he did. Isaiah uh, chapter 28, verse 16, as we referenced earlier, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And, and he puts a question mark there because it's a question. It should be marvelous in our eyes, but oftentimes it's not. We just ho-hum, it's all good. It's, uh, we're all headed the same way. No, we ain't. It should be marvelous in our eyes. That's Matthew 21, 40, 42. And then in Acts chapter 4, and by the way, he was speaking to the nation of Israel in the book of Matthew because they were looking for the kingdom to come in as we get into our doctoral dissertation here. And we understand that was to the Jew. But could I rec could you, would you recognize this with me as we look at these passages uh, talking about the stumbling stone, the Lord Jesus Christ, the stone? Peter is not referencing at this point in 1 Peter chapter 2, he is not referencing the nation of Israel. He's at the end of his days. He was the apostle to the Jew. He watched the Jews reject, reject, reject. And by the time he's writing this passage, he is focused solely on the church and he's called a pillar of the New Testament church, which was a mystery and was hid to those people. So here in 1 Peter chapter 2, he's not referencing the rejection that the Jews did of Christ, the stumbling block. He's referencing that dual meaning of the verse by Isaiah of people rejecting Christ as the head cornerstone of the church. He's the foundation and Peter and Paul, those guys, they were the pillars in Ephesians chapter 2 of the church. That's in reference. So we get our doctrine straight. Uh, I always take the time to kind of lay that out. You say, why? Because most people that want to teach or believe something or get up and they don't take the time to understand the Jew. They got the Jew mingled in with the church. You got to get the Jew right the Gentile right, and the church right. And if you get the Jew right and all his patches and the Gentile right and the church right, you'll get your doctor right in the word of God. When somebody comes in and says, well, well, I had a vision. You know, Peter had a vision over there in the book of Acts, so I know that I should have a vision. No, look, you have to understand why, therefore, wherefore, he had that vision at that time and why God used it. Didn't have the word of God completed. Revelation wasn't yet. Peter hadn't written yet. Paul hadn't formed uh, anything for the Gentile yet. A whole lot of things going on. You say, what was going on? God was just warming Peter up to realize when he put down that sheet and he was in a trance on a roof and he was hungered and he was waiting for the meal to come, but he had a vision. He was allowed to have a vision. You say, why? He was an apostle. We're not apostles today. There's a whole lot. When somebody comes in and says, well, I had a vision last night. I just saw it, man. When it happened, Bob, oh, I got in a car wreck and, man, it tore my head off, my leg off, and I had this vision. I know I'm saved. I'm going to look right at him. I said, the word of God is going to get ready to offend you. And they're going to look at me and like, what do you mean? That's not your salvation. If that's your salvation, the devil sold you a bill of goods. Your salvation is in the finished work of Christ. It may have happened to bring you to this knowledge and God may have put me here. Oh, I don't believe that Bible. Say, what's he doing? Stumbling at the cornerstone. Stumbling at the word of God. Because what did we read when we first started this, this little lesson this morning? We, we started out here, it says, wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures. Look, if it's happening, it's not in the scriptures, we got a problem. You'll be preaching some false gospel someplace, some false doctrine. Let me, let me hurry on. Acts chapter 4, 11 through 12. This is the stone, another reference on the stone. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. And when you're reading Acts chapter 4, that was still the Sanhedrin. That was still the Jews. That was still the Pharisees. They were rejecting Christ. And that's why it's said like it is, which has become the head of the corner. And that reference is no matter what you believe or what you say or what you feel, he's still Christ and he's still the head. And he's the cornerstone. Verse 12, he goes on. Here's the famous verse that we quote. Neither is there salvation any other, but there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's not your feelings. It's not your emotions. And I understand we got all that. But 
It's in the scriptures. It's what the book says, not what we feel. Watch it. Ephesians 2, Paul says this, 19 and 22. Look, I've given plenty of verses for the, the lesson this morning. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, talking to saved people, and of the household of God, saved folks, verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles. I referenced that earlier. And a prophet, Jesus Christ himself, watch it, watch it, being the chief cornerstone. Do you see the dual application? He was the cornerstone for the nation of Israel. They rejected him. They stumbled at him. They didn't believe the word of God. He is still the stone, but now he's the cornerstone and stone for the believers in Christ Jesus. Luke, the apostle, writing it here, Paul echoes the same sentiments, and Peter at the end of his days is saying the very same thing. Verse 21 of, of, of Ephesians 2, where Paul's speaking, in whom also the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Say, what are we today? We believers are a temple to the Lord. God dwells in the believer. When we get together, I can't help but believe that God is glorified, God is, is blessed when he sees the believers come together around his word and can walk out and say, praise the Lord. Man, the word of God feeds my soul. I believe that book, man. When, when we can say that, uh, God is blessed. And that's what he's saying in whom also the building fitly framed together, groweth in the holy temple of the Lord. Say, what's, what's our desire? It's to grow the church spiritually. It's to see the church and the people of the church strengthened spiritually and even physically watch it verse 22 in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of god through the spirit now that's paul speaking to the ephesus people that's that's paul on epistle to the church this morning we've taken what peter said we've linked it up with the old testament scriptures and how the jews rejected the cornerstone i've showed you where so-called believers will reject the word of god today and reject christ by rejecting the word of god the whole while telling you how much they love Jesus you can't put a round peg in a square hole let me quit with this who is the cornerstone of your life today I know who it should be remember to reject the word of God is to reject the cornerstone of or to reject Christ. And that's where it comes. People say, I just don't believe it says what you say it says. And they'll come in smiling and try to tell you what a great Christian they are. How they love Jesus. I don't doubt that they don't have those. Could I say deceptions? Seven times warned in the New Testament, be not deceived. Because that's the greatest power the devil has to deceive you into thinking something that ain't true. You want to know if what you believe is true, line up the Word of God. If what you believe doesn't line up with the Word of God, you need to get rid of what you believe and change your belief to what the Word of God says. Yeah. Say, what will that do for me? It will make you, <laughs> it'll make you strange and unusual, and that's who you are anyway. Okay, let me quit there. We're out of time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a good morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for health and all that you've done for our church and our church body. Thank you for our pastor today and ask you to bless him as he preaches and the singers as he sing, Brother Jeff, as he leads and all special music and the singers. Pray for them. And then if there's someone here lost, obviously, Lord, our heart goes out. We want to see them saved. We want to see them come to know you as Lord and Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it. Amen.